Are you tired of carrying around a bulky wallet and jangling keys? I have a solution for you, and that would be the Ridge Wallet and Key Case. The wallet is slim, it's minimalist, it's made from premium materials. This is their burnt titanium model, which looks fantastic. It holds up to 12 cards, although what you're doing with 12 cards, I don't know. I've got a couple of bank cards in here and my ID. That's, that's the three main ones I need, but if you've got more, it will easily handle it. Plus room for cash. You just slip that in the back there. Easy. There are over 30 colors and styles to choose, including carbon fiber and burnt titanium. There's really a ridge wallet for everyone. And then there's the key case. It's a key organizer. Basically what you do is sort of like a little Swiss army knife. It takes about five minutes. You put your keys in here and then you're ready to go. These are my work keys. And I have it like outside door, inside door top, inside door bottom. And this is the mailbox key. <laughs> It holds everything in place. There's no jangle. It fits nicely in a pocket. It's just a better solution. The Ridge Wallet and Keycase combo come with a lifetime warranty and RFID blocking technology to protect you from digital pickpockets. You can even test drive it for 99 days and send it back for a full refund if you don't love it. So why not check out Ridge Wallet and the Keycase at ridge.com shadows, or you can click the link in the description below. Don't forget to use the promo code shadows for a 10% discount at checkout. Ridge.com shadows, promo code shadows. And now today's video. There are numerous secret military bases all over the world. Most of what happens within the walls of these facilities remains highly classified even after as much as a century. America's Area 51 and Russia's Kapustin Yar often spring to mind as some of the most well-known locations that are shrouded in mystery and about whom conspiracy theories abound. But England is home to another such facility, one that has specialized in biological and chemical warfare for nearly a century. That secret base is Porton Down, and it's what we're talking about in today's video. The secret base is located northeast of the village of Porton near Salisbury in Wiltshire, England. It was originally opened in 1916, making it the oldest active chemical weapons research facility in the world. It was originally named the War Department Experimentation Station and has undergone nearly a dozen name changes since then. But the name by which it is most well known is simply Porton Down. In response to the Germans' use of chemical weapons in World War I, like chlorine, mustard gas, and phosgene, the original research at Porton Down was to find ways to counteract these weapons. Early efforts focused on things like respirators and other anti-gas measures. After the war drew to a close, the research facility was nearly abandoned, running on a skeleton crew. However, this was not going to last. As the government considered the future of chemical warfare and defense, it was determined that the best defense is a good offense. In 1920, it was decided the Port and Down needed to dramatically increase its staff, including by recruiting civilian scientists. By 1922, the skeleton crew had increased to 380 servicemen, 23 scientific and technical civil servants, and 25 civilian scientists. Those numbers would double by 1925. In 1925, the Geneva Protocol proposed a prohibition on chemical and biological weapons in warfare. Today, 146 nations have ratified the proposal. England even ratified it in 1930, but they did so with reservations. Fearing that some nation could repeat Germany's actions from World War I, they reserved the right to use chemical weapons in retaliation against another country that used them first. This gave them justification to further their research and weapons testing at Port and Down, though such reservations weren't really necessary. The ban on chemical warfare didn't stop any country from continuing their research, just in case. The vast majority of what happens at Porton Down is unknown, with information only really beginning to surface after about 70 years. One of the first experiments carried out by the Porton Down scientists was an unethical, if not illegal, series of human tests known as the Rowell Pindy experiments. In the early 1930s, scientists from Porton Down traveled to a military base in Rawal Pindi in what is modern day Pakistan. There, they would conduct human chemical weapons trials on members of the British Indian Army. While we know that the latter experiments at Porton Down relied on people who technically volunteered, even if they were lied to about what they were volunteering for, records from before the late 1940s haven't been preserved. It's not unreasonable to assume that the Indian soldiers who volunteered for these experiments volunteered in much the same way that India volunteered to fall under England's colonial rule. 
The Raoul-Pindy experiments, which lasted for more than 10 years, involved marching soldiers into gas chambers to be exposed to mustard gas. The effects of mustard gas weren't exactly a mystery at this point, as it was commonly used during World War I. Exposure could cause severe burns, blisters on the skin, respiratory problems, and much, much more. It was rarely fatal, but recovery could see a soldier in hospital for weeks or months in a constant state of agony. There were two purposes of these tests. The first was to try and determine the appropriate dosage of mustard gas to use if they were forced to retaliate using chemical weapons. The second was to see if the Indian people's skin would be more or less susceptible to burns from the chemical. Obviously, the answer was that the effects were the same, but that didn't stop the scientists from spending over a decade subjecting over 500 Indian soldiers to mustard gas, just to be sure. Although no long-term effects of exposure were documented as part of these trials, that's also because the scientists never followed up on the soldiers. Once they recovered and were released from the hospital, that was the end of that soldier's involvement with the experiment. We now know that mustard gas is highly carcinogenic. But we'll never know what specific long-term effects that the victims of the Raoul Pindi experiment suffered. During World War II, the British government wanted to test whether or not a bioweapons attack using anthrax would be viable. They recognized that, if successful, the test would cause severe and long-lasting damage to the area. To avoid endangering citizens, they took control of the remote and uninhabited Grenard Islands from its owner for £500 using compulsory acquisition. Because the island was completely uninhabited, researchers transported 80 sheep to the island along with their anthrax bomb. The sheep were tethered to a location near the bomb, which was affixed to the top of a pole. When the bomb detonated, a brownish cloud of anthrax spores was released and drifted towards the animals. Within days, all of the sheep had died, and their bodies were disposed of in an incinerator. The conclusion from this experiment was that if detonated in a German city, an anthrax bomb would cause a severe loss of life and leave the area completely uninhabitable for decades. They knew it would remain uninhabitable because their efforts to decontaminate Grenard Island were unsuccessful due to the resiliency of the anthrax spores. The island was placed under indefinite quarantine, with the only visitors allowed being scientists from Port and Down who would occasionally check the contamination level. But the previous owner wanted his land back. The government was only supposed to have been borrowing it, and following the end of World War II, it was intended to be returned. It was agreed that the island would be returned to either the original owner or to his heirs for the original £500 sale price as soon as it was declared fit for habitation by man and beast. Despite this agreement, no efforts were made to decontaminate the island as they were considered too expensive and hazardous. Normally, Portendown was able to conduct his experiments in secret, with the general public completely unaware of what was going on, but this time it was different. There was a transfer of property involving a private citizen, and an entire island had been quarantined. While it wasn't common knowledge throughout the entire UK, those in the Scottish Highlands were aware of what happened and were more than a little disappointed with the government's failure to decontaminate the island. In 1981, a Scottish militant group identifying themselves as Dark Harvest Commando began sending messages to newspapers demanding that the government decontaminate the island. They claimed to have sent a team of microbiologists to the island to collect 300 pounds of contaminated soil. These claims were later backed up when a package containing soil contaminated with anthrax was dropped off outside a Port and Down. A few days later, an identical package was left in Blackpool, a resort town where the Conservative Party, who were in power at the time, were holding their annual conference. The second package contained the same type of soil as was found on the island, though it did not contain anthrax. Dark Harvest Commando threatened to continue to leave contaminated soil at locations that would ensure the rapid loss of indifference of the government and the equally rapid education of the general public. Finally, in 1986, the government enacted its first real plan to decontaminate Grenard Island. The most contaminated soil uh, was removed, while the entire island was sprayed with 280 tons of formaldehyde diluted with seawater. They then placed some sheep on the island, and after four years of the sheep remaining healthy, the island was deemed safe again and sold back to the heirs at the original price of £500. It took 48 years, threats of domestic terrorism and a major decontamination effort from the government, but the effects of the single anthrax bomb detonated by the scientists of Port and Down had finally been neutralized. Having seen the effectiveness of anthrax bombs, scientists at Port and Down decided to continue their biological weapons testing with less deadly alternatives. But since they weren't using anything as deadly as anthrax, this time they felt justified in using human subjects without their knowledge or consent. 
From 1953 through 1975, tests were conducted to see how much damage a single ship or aircraft carrying a biological agent could do to a population. The tests were carried out in Lyme Bay, targeting South Dorset, England. Initial tests were conducted using zinc cadmium sulfide as a surrogate for an actual biological agent. It was chosen because its fluorescent properties made it easy to track how far it had traveled and also because it wasn't an actual disease. However, repeated exposure to the compound can have harmful effects on humans. Once again, the tests were a rousing success for Portendown. They showed that a single aircraft flying along the coast could contaminate an area of over 10,000 square miles, with areas over 100 miles from where the plane was spraying becoming contaminated. While these results were promising, they were only spraying a chemical compound. In the early 60s, they switched to using live bacteria to see if the results would be any different. Though less deadly than anthrax, the bacteria they used for the tests, such as E. coli, could still have harmful effects. It wasn't until decades later that the public became aware of these weapons trials. Despite demands from the areas that had been affected, the government refused to hold a public inquiry into the experiments. And Porton Down did not shy away from testing on unsuspecting populations, and it is also known that the scientists spent 15 months in Obnagohoro in Nigeria testing experimental nerve gases. Very few details are known about these experiments, including how the Nigerians they were tested on were affected. However, it is likely that these experiments were to test the effectiveness of their newly developed VX nerve gas. VX is the most potent and most deadly nerve agent ever developed, and it is so dangerous that it was even a major plot device in a Michael Bay movie. But to get to the point of developing VX gas, they were going to need to test and better understand existing nerve agents, most notably sarin. This was going to require extensive human testing, so they turned to their own servicemen for volunteers. Of course, few people would willingly volunteer to subject themselves to being doused with nerve toxins in exchange for a meager financial reward, so they lied. Rather than stating their intended goal, volunteers were told that the scientists were experimenting with cures for the common cold. Thousands of volunteers, believing they were taking part in a largely harmless study, were subjected to sarin. Most people were absolutely traumatized by the experience, suffering severe PTSD, though peculiarly there were actually some repeat volunteers. These tests also resulted in the only known death at the hands of the Port and Down scientists. Leading aircraftman Robert Madison volunteered for the experiments after being offered 15 shillings and three days of leave. He had hoped to use the money to buy an engagement ring for his girlfriend, but he never got the chance. The first serious reaction to the sarin had occurred a little more than a month earlier, when a volunteer fell into a coma after being exposed to 300 milligrams. The scientists were ordered to dramatically reduce the dosage used, but they felt that they knew better. Madison was exposed to 200 milligrams of sarin applied to his uniform. While the dose had been lowered from the previous experiment, it was still significantly higher than they were supposed to be using to test with. Within 20 minutes of the application of the sarin to his clothing, Madison began to complain that he didn't feel well. The contaminated clothing was removed and he was taken out of the gas chamber to a bench. An ambulance was immediately called, but before it could arrive, he was convulsing and gasping for breath. Despite the medical staff's best efforts, Madison died just 43 minutes after his exposure to the nerve agent. An internal inquiry ruled that Madison died because of a personal idiosyncrasy, essentially claiming that he was unusually sensitive to the poison and that the dose should not have been lethal. Because of this idiosyncrasy, many of his organs were harvested without the knowledge or consent of his family to be used for continued testing because, apparently, killing him was just not evil enough. From 1949 through 1989, as many as 20,000 people were used for experimentation without their informed consent, and oftentimes without consent at all. This total also does not include those that were tested in Nigeria or Dorset or any other places where people were experimented on before 1949. But not all of the human experiments were quite as nefarious as mustard gas or sarin. Some soldiers were instead given psychotropic drugs. These experiments used a combination of volunteers and those that were unknowingly dosed, though it is unlikely the volunteers knew uh, what they were signing up for. Though still unethical, if not outright illegal, these experiments weren't quite as dangerous as the others. The military wanted to know whether or not psychotropic drugs could be weaponized in combat situations. Subjects were given doses of either LSD or liquid THC, and it was then seen if they could perform tasks like operating a vehicle. They could not, but the idea of trying to use these drugs as weapons was quickly abandoned. Despite not carrying the same level of risk as the other experiments, these still resulted in numerous cases of PTSD from those who were given LSD without their knowledge. 
Although the kindest thing we're able to say about Port and Down thus far is that they unknowingly dosed people with psychotropic drugs, their existence remains a bit of a mixed bag. Port and Down is the UK's leading facility for researching vaccines. Their labs have also been used to identify viruses and toxins in worldwide outbreaks such as the initial Ebola outbreaks in Africa in the 1970s. There's certainly some work being done there to benefit the greater good, but it can't erase the atrocities that they have performed either, especially as the full extent of what was done in pursuit of their secret research is unknown. Much of what is known is a result of Operation Antler, a 1999 police investigation into the human experiments conducted by Port and Down through 1989. Though the Crown Prosecution Service chose not to proceed with any criminal prosecutions, not even in the case of the unlawful death of Ronald Madison, Operation Antler still helped illuminate quite a bit of Port and Down's past. But what about their present? The fact is, we simply don't know. Even though the site is now shared with some private and commercial scientific ventures, Port and Down remains a secret military facility. A secret military facility that still manufactures nerve gas and has samples of all the world's deadliest diseases, including the plague. With regards to their current research, we'd like to hope that they've at least learned their lesson about unlawful human experimentation, but there's no way to know for sure, because that information is, of course, classified. 